gentlemen, Mr. Dan Mason. Uh, thank you, Carl. I really didn't expect this big a crowd either today. Uh, okay, everybody leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, if you've got to fall asleep, please don't snore. Uh, <laughs> some people find history boring, but then again, other people, when they start listening to me, I automatically fall asleep. I don't know why. But anyways, uh, I represent Detroit Metro Airport as their historian. I'm a volunteer there. And uh, after writing the history book, I, before I even finished the writing the book, I asked them, the members of the airport there and the public affairs, what are you going to do with all your photos uh, that you have in these boxes here? They, they had been collected for 51 years by a woman that re had worked for the airport for 51 years. And uh, she kept track of newspaper clippings, photos. And they said they were just going to send them out and get them digitized. I says, well, I says, that's a nice idea, but they won't actually, they'll be just digitized. They won't be cataloged or anything. So I so told them, I said, I'll tell you what, uh, you give me three things and I'll, I'll, I'll work with you on this. And I said, you give me an office, a computer, and a parking space so I don't have to pay every day. <laughs> and sure enough, they took care of me. I, I, they were good to their word because they, they were skeptical at first if I was going to write this book. Next thing I know, uh, uh, it came along and I got the publisher. We got it published and I asked them, hey, can we have my book signing, your first book uh, appearance at the uh, fountain? Oh my gosh, we didn't realize you were actually going to write this. And sure enough, <laughs> then uh, a month later after the, it was published, they said, we're working on it, we're working on it, we're getting you this office. We, we want you to do this for us. But anyways, uh, to start off, the airport uh, came along uh, as, a, as an idea back in 1927 when the state of Michigan enacted that every county should have an airport because of the upcoming airplanes being produced by all these different air plane manufacturers. Uh, Wayne County was one of those counties, of course, that approached its citizens to raise money to build an airport. They raised a bond of $2 million. Uh, of course, in today's uh, cost for the airport today of what they spent, they could have probably bought at least 20 of them by now. But to, uh, to continue on, they had 70 choices to go for, for the airport, and they f signed, decided to settle on Ramis, one little square mile that was located between Goddard Road and Wick, between Middle Belt and Merriman. And on January, or I should say April of 1929, groundbreaking broke, and the airport started to grow. You can see the construction here. This is a photo in 1929. And they were pretty quick at building this airport. Before they even built the airport, they did its land studies of, of how, the, how the drainage was going to be in the area, everything. But that's what they came up with. By the time the airport was open, there had already been an airplane landing there. The first landing was by Thompson Aeronautical. And one of the reasons for building the airport was for the mail delivery. And Thompson Aeronautical, like every other airlines that was starting out, was flying the mail, and that's what they did was they brought the mail in. When grand opening came along, Edward Hines, who was actually the uh, chairman of the board of uh, Wayne County, decided this was it, and uh, this is part of his uh, uh, speech that he gave and down here. It says, huge transcontinental airliners will dock here. Great freight carriers will zoom down from the sky Smaller craft of every description will follow the air lanes to this port. Passengers and freight will be speeded along the broad highways leading to this terminal to the, the, metropolitan, the metropolitan center, Metropolitan Center. A great new industry will make this airport one of the, its most important ports of call. This is not a dream of the future. It is an actuality of today, and it still continues on today. Well, uh, we still have many different airlines flying in here, many different types of planes coming in. Just last, back in December, we had our first 787 Dreamliner come in by Royal Jordanian Airlines. And I was there to document that moment when it came in. Now, as I was doing some research and I was at the Romulus Pub, uh, 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 Historical Society, I was going through some of the papers and this was shown to me. And this is a letter given to one of the uh, people or persons that gave up their property for the airport. 
there's a letter just stating that if you come on out here on, on opening day on uh, September 4th, 1930, you and another person can go up on a free airplane ride. Just remember to bring the letter. Uh, a few years ago when I was looking at that, that, air, that phone number there for, uh, that actually did exist until just a couple weeks ago when I went to back check it and it's no longer in function, but it was still used by the county. All right, now the first passenger service started with Stout Airlines on September 4th, 1930. Uh, I mentioned that Thomas Aeronautical was the first one to land, but the first passenger service was started by Stout, William Stout. William Stout was partnered with Henry Ford to build the Ford Tri-Motors and any other aircraft. Uh, basically, Stout had written a letter to Ford while they were uh, partnered together building aircraft, says building planes is not going to be the future. The future is going to be flying passenger service. And as you can see here, they had his signing off as first uh, passenger service for Detroit or Wayne County Airport. Uh, one of the things I should say is the airport went through four name changes. The first name was Wayne County Airport because of the fact that they didn't really have an official name. It just belonged to the county. Here's a photo of the opening day. Kids go um, party balloons and stuff. You can see uh, this is building 278, which is the original hangar at the airport. It had just been uh, uh, raised a few uh, back in September because of the fact that it had become so unsafe. There was no sense in trying to leave, try and re renovate the building. It basically outlived its usefulness, which is a shame. And I occasionally tease a few people and say, oh, look, I think I see your photo in there. And that's another photo of the building itself in its prime when it was first built. It's a beautiful building. This building actually set up there um, that they could fit at least uh, 50 airplanes inside there basically at the time. Okay, on opening day, they uh, basically had some air show demonstrations. And this, one of the things about the airport was it was also a part of the Commerce Department. Uh, basically, people would bring their planes out there to go through trial runs and testing them to make sure that uh, they'd be qualified and, and approved for uh, manufacturing. I'm not sure how well this plane flew, but I do know how well it landed. <laughs> I always liked this one. Well, I was reading a book uh, on uh, Michigan aviation through uh, Arcadia. I noticed that photo in the book, and uh, if the guy had gone through, because he basically didn't know anything about the plane or anything else about it, if he'd gone through the photos at the uh, place where I was at, he would have found this photo. This is Charles Proctor. He was the first manager of the airport. He was responsible for every day-to-day -day operations, including the control tower. There was a control tower at the south end of the building, and then at the north end of the building was the U.S. Weather Bureau. Without the U.S. Weather Bureau, they wouldn't be able to know what the conditions was going to be like for, the, uh, for uh, any flights coming in and going out of the airport, and especially when the pilots would radio in what their conditions there. But Charles here is responsible for everything, and uh, he did a good job at the time, from my understanding. Talking to a few people that a uh, little bit older that were around over there in that area, knew him. This is the control tower at the south end. This uh, right here, let me see. Oh. That there was basically a loudspeaker, and uh, it was directional. It was basically, uh, it, it could point it in any direction on the field there. And, trying to get hold of anyone's attention so they could say, hey, look, uh, you're traveling the wrong way. You need to go to the other, other land, other runway. And the runways were lit up, too. They had lightings for the runway. They had nine different uh, radio frequencies that they, they can be in touch with the pilots. And one of the things that was also there at the airport, too, is they had their own power plant. So the, basically, if pilots were flying at night, this building was well lit and could be seen for miles. And you can see the aircraft here inside the building as well as the photo here. Now, by 1938, they realized passenger service was increasing. So they had to have a better place for these passengers to wait for their aircraft so it kept them out of the elements or keep them away from the airplane. So the executive terminal was erected and, start, and construction began in 1938. It was opened by 1939. This is the photo itself at the bottom here. And well, I was trying to find a photo of, uh, of the interior for my book, which came a little bit too late. And this was the interior here. Well, I keep hitting the wrong button. 
This is the interior here. It's very nice and you know, with all the Art Deco. None of that up here exists anymore at the moment. Uh, the airport is you know, just beginning to re, uh, renovate the building back the way it was. We're not even sure if the railings are still up there or not because uh, the uh, people that were leasing the building had walled that off. So it was like, why'd they do that? They don't know, so there's a lot of stuff going on. The only thing that really exists of its original Art Deco is on the right side. Keep hitting the wrong button. Right side here. I was able to capture this. That still exists inside the building. So they have a guideline now of the interior of the building. If they want to go back and try and get some of this stuff back into place right here, because basically a lot of this is gone. It's changed a lot inside there. We'll move on and yeah, let's see. Okay, that's the airport back in 1939. Just remember that. This is one square mile right here, this whole area. You got Goddard Road, Wick Road, Middle Belt, and over here, Merriman. Powerhouse is here. Building 278, the hangar is here. And right here is the executive terminal. But to the south, that's the National Guard base. One of the things that uh, I can actually say about Detroit or Wayne County Airport, Detroit Metro Airport, was it had a military presence also. It was there, uh, Michigan. Uh, National Guard decided that they were going to move their operation from Rouge Park over to Wayne County Airport and they had erected a facility for them and had everything that they could use. It had the hangar, it had uh, bedrooms, officers lounge, schooling rooms, a mess hall. So this is all set up for Michigan's National Guard. I'll move on here. All right. They were known as the 107th Observation Squadron. And all the way up until 1940, they were going through different types of airplanes. But by 1940, they were called to active duty for the um, United States Army Air Corps. And so they were training. And most of the, uh, they were basically transferred out to the East Coast to do uh, reconnaissance over the, over the Atlantic Ocean, looking for submarines and spotting submarines. By 1941, they were transferred out to uh, England, and they were the first reconnaissance group uh, to arrive into Europe. I should say 1940, I'm sorry, 1942. They were, the, they were basically responsible for quite a few things. One of the things was that they were instrumental in was uh, all the uh, reconnaissance of Normandy and the, and the French coast prior to uh, D-Day, uh, or June 4th, 1944. They, did, they were basically decorated for their um, uh, going over there and getting all those photos with enemy fire at the same time. Then right back here behind the cockpit, there was a camera there, so they would fly sideways taking photos of the, uh, of the uh, beach, beach, beach front there of everything that was there. Uh, on D-Day itself, they supported uh, call it a little group here. Well, they, were, they basically gave close ground support for some of, uh, for, I believe, the 1st Infantry. I have to still check that one out, I can't recall. But that's what they did. And they were a well-decorated group. They had a presidential citation. Okay. During the war itself, though, Wayne County became the Ramis Army Airfield. So that's the second name change that it went through. Uh, basically, the Army Air Corps had leased half the field in 1941 beginning of 41, started making changes. By the end of 1941, they had leased the whole field. Basically, there was a need for uh, transfer stations or f transfer fields for flying planes across the continental U.S. for refueling. Rimus was ide uh, ideal for the fact that it was already modernized. It had all the equipment there, the lighting, the uh, hangars. So all basically the Army Air Corps did was they turned around and they had more buildings to the place. One of the unique thing about it, though, was by 1943 was the start of women flying for the uh, military. And that's basically called the WASP, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots. By, uh, they were actually first known as the Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron. 30 women were first trained in 1942. And by January 1943, they were divided up. Five women were brought here to Romulus. Of course. These women here, uh, two of them played a significant role. They basically, they were starting off flying trainers. But these, 
these two women, Barbara Donahue and Adela Shar, well, they seen that these women were good pilots, so they were the first to start flying pursuit planes. They were trained to fly pursuit planes. And one of the things was, was they were rated top in class when they finished uh, their training. These women did the one thing that the men did not do. And can, I, can anyone answer why they did good? Any ideas? What's that? <laughs> well, <laughs> close, close. They read the manual. They read the manual. Yes, yeah, so they basically they were training to fly this plane here, right here, the uh, P-39 era Cobra. And what's unique about this plane was it was built by Bell Aircraft. Uh, these planes here had a rear engine. The plane, the engine was located right here behind the cockpit, and it had a drive shaft that ran up through the up to the nose, which gave the capability of having more guns in the nose of the plane, more more, yeah, more weaponry. So you had a 50 caliber cannon in the nose and two machine guns, then machine guns on the wings. The uh, drawback was this plane did not have a canopy, but actually had a door. So when they got into the plane, these people would sit on their parachutes, and if they had to bail out of the plane, the doors would jettison off, but they would still have to crawl out of the plane to get out. So there's, you know, a lot of times a lot of the men would get hurt just from the plane, you know, jumping out uh, and trying to get out of the plane. One of the things that these women learned, though, was a lot of the men there thought, oh, yeah, we can fly this, we can fly this. They just couldn't just fly it. The manufacturer said, look, you need to build up to this RPMs. Don't go above this. We need you to do it this way and take off. Otherwise, when you get up in the air, your plane's going to be overheated because of the fact that that propeller wasn't cooling down the engine. It was basically being cooled down by an intake that was located by the pilot, behind the pilot. So that wasn't very much air getting into the plane. And it had a few other things that went wrong that wasn't quite right with the plane. It had a tricycle landing gear. It was beautiful, so it was easy to uh, see how you're taking off. You'd actually see the runway uh, versus a tail dragger. Well, you, if you're flying a plane with, with a cockpit above the wings, you really couldn't see the uh, runway too well. We'll move on here. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how's this? Okay. You know, why don't I just take this off here? Okay, uh, these are the blueprints for the uh, airport that the Army Corps of Engineers came up with in 1943. The reason why I have this up here was the airport has a numbering system for all their buildings, and they continue to use that same numbering system today. Building 278, I mentioned earlier, the old hangar was located right here. And right here, this building here is 358, that's the executive terminal. But they used that, basically those are the only buildings, well, I should say, there's only a couple buildings left that are still left over from World War II. There's the uh, executive terminal, this other building right here, which used, was used for communications, and a transformer building right here. Everything else is gone now. Just back in 2009, these were the remaining of the buildings that was left over from World War II, and they were torn down. They were used as apartments. One of the things that the uh, women went through was the fact that uh, there was 1,109 WASP pilots during the war that served, and there was 69 women that perished from, uh, from flight accidents. Two of the women were from Romulus. And the first woman here, oh, I'll back that up, I'll keep it in the wrong button. This woman is Hazel Ying Li. She was one of two Asian Americans that served for the uh, uh, WASP pilots. And uh, there was only one other person that was not Caucasian, and she was a Navajo Indian. Uh, I've had a few people say, well, there was African-American women. I said, no. Uh, I've got all the information on that. And in fact, I know a woman who's written extensively about them, and uh, they just felt the women weren't qualified to fly like the men. They gave, you know, the women did not have that opportunity to fly. <coughs> the other woman that passed away is uh, Alice, uh, Alice Starr. I'm sorry, Lovejoy. She uh, also was, uh, per uh, perished. She was in a training accident when she was learning to fly, but Hazel was a different circumstance. She was flying one of the P-39s from uh, Romulus to uh, Great Falls, Montana. And once she was flying the plane in for a landing, there was another plane coming in at the same time. Well, that plane it's, uh, that they were trying to contact did not have radio functioning, so they could not know who was flying which plane to contact them. So they collided. She died three days later after her burns when she was pulled from the wreckage. So 
one of the things I'm trying to do at the airport is trying to get some recognition of these women that served because, you know, throughout the years, uh, after the war was over, they basically said, okay, we're done with you. This was in, at the end of 1944 and sent them home. And they weren't given any uh, benefits of whatever from the military because of the fact that they were civilians treated as military. Uh, when she was brought back to Washington where she was from, uh, her brother was also in the military too. He was overseas uh, with the uh, Go for Broke unit. I forgot the, which number they w was that he was with, but he had was killed in action. And when they brought those two over to bur be buried in the veteran cemetery, they said, no, 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 sorry, they're Asian. We don't want them buried here. It wasn't until the 1970s that their bodies were uh, uh, transplanted over to the veteran cemetery with honors. Uh, is anybody familiar with the, the song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Do anybody know who this guy is? Yeah. Does anybody know that he served here in Romulus? Yeah. Well, the women missed chance on seeing him. But he served in the, in the military there. He wanted to fly fighter planes, but the Army, said, and, the Army and Navy both said, nah, you're too old. But you know what? Well, you can actually fly transport for us and work with them. So he did. He, he uh, signed off his uh, radio show, told, told the American uh, public, I'm going to war, guys. I'm going to go serve my country. But he still continued on with his radio show, and he flew the China-Burma hub. And when he came back after serving over there, he was at stationed at Luke Field. Then he, they transferred him in 1945 in spring and served over in Romulus for a few months. And while he was there, he had a chance to do some bond raising and get some women to join the WACs. And, but the women that were flying there did not get a chance to see him. Of course, the fact that they were gone by 1940, at the end of 1944. And going over here, this is what the field looked like for the airport by 1947, or actually 1952. This is actually out of order. I'm sorry. <laughs> but here's the Air National Guard base. I'm going to continue on about the military here for a few minutes just for the fact I want to get them out of the way. Um, they, they did quite a bit. When the, when the guys came back from, from uh, Europe, they were stationed here until about 1951. Then they were sent off to Luke Field themselves for some more training. They thought they were going to send them over to Korea. But while that was going on, a new headquarters was built for them. And I'm still out of place here. <laughs> but I'll just continue on here. Um, 1947, the airport reverted back. We'll just go with that. 1947, the airport reverted back to uh, Wayne County. The county did not like at all what they did with the improvements the Army did. They thought, well, this is a mess. So they bought up three more uh, acres of land. And as on the previous photo here, you can see the expansion of the airport here where they expanded the three miles. And then they built a new control tower and a new uh, passenger terminal, which is right here. They renamed the airport Detroit Wayne Major Airport in 1947. They wanted a fresh new start, and that's what they did. So they went ahead and built this building. And throughout the years, you know, they had air shows at the, air, um, at the airport and air races. And this was the center of, of the airport itself. There was an operation that was going on over at Willow Run where they were running passenger service. And the county was trying to revert all that passenger service back over to Wayne County. That was the reason for the expansion. They seen the planes were getting bigger and they knew that the runways, at, uh, the original runways were going to be way too short. And uh, just to give you a general idea, this is how the control room looked for the, uh, for the uh, radar. And uh, it, actually, they didn't really have radar. It was all done by T cards. So by 1952, they still didn't have the radar installed for the airport, but they still kept track of where the planes were at by cards. And they would just pass them off from one radio operator to another as the plane got closer to Detroit or away from Detroit. Now I'm getting back to, world, uh, to the uh, <laughs> National Guard guys. This was the uh, National Guard building back in 1930. And as you can see, all the latest of planes that they had here, well, they didn't have the latest of planes. What happened was the National Guard was treated sort of like uh, the bastard child, so to speak. Uh, they were given whatever the Army was tired of using, the place you planes that were worn out. And so basically whatever they had to work with, they had basically had to rebuild all their planes. Now remember that later because I'm going to have another photo here later to show you. But all these planes here, that was what they had to work with. 
Uh, of course, we had the Jenny biplane, and this is a consolidated PT-1. These were the planes that for them was state of the art, but they had to rebuild all those engines on those planes and go through and refurbish the planes. They were in sad shape. But as I was saying, uh, I didn't get a chance to say, I was telling some other people, this is what the officer's lounge looked like inside that headquarters. Really nice, chandeliers. But by 1952, as I said, they built a new structure. This is it right here. Uh, basically, the National Guard was at uh, Ramius from 1930 to 1971. By 1971, this building became the uh, Wayne County's uh, Sheriff's Department. Actually, later, about the 1980s, the airport was still using it for other means. All right, 1947 was also the year that the Air Force became into being. Okay, they changed a lot of things. They changed the names of the planes. Uh, for example, the P-51 became the A-51. Uh, one of the things about uh, the group here in Rhymus, they changed from the 107th uh, Observation Wing during World War II, it became the Tactical Reconnaissance uh, Squadron, and now they became the 127th Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron. I have an example here of two different planes here. Can anyone tell me the difference of these two planes other than the markings? Rolls-Royce engines? Well, they, both, they all had the Rolls-Royce engines by then. But the difference on the planes is, is, is uh, remember, these are recon well, we got a reconnaissance, reconnaissance operation here. So one of the planes was set up for reconnaissance, the other one's not. That's, that, that's my clue. Okay, I, I figured you got... Uh, I was, given this, I was given this test myself, and I tell you, I failed drastically. I kept saying, uh, could it be A and G on there? No. Uh, the gentleman that showed me this passed away, but it says, so back here behind the, the insignia, that's where a camera is at. They removed the fuel tank that was back there and put in the camera for, uh, for reconnaissance. So basically, when the camera used to be behind the cockpit, it was now moved back here. I just had to throw that one in just for the fact I was made a fool of. All right, uh, being that uh, this was the Michigan Air National Guard, like the president himself having an Air Force One, so did the governor of Michigan. He had his own personal plane, and that's this DC-3 here, where these uh, basically young uh, ROTC men are just getting a chance to sit there and look at an engine on a DC-3. Well, back then, well, military-wise, C-47. This plane here was flown many times by the governor of Michigan. There's one incident where the governor was flying into Lansing and the runway was so slick of ice that the plane skidded off the runway, but nobody was hurt, just a little shooken up. Uh, as I mentioned, the, pl uh, the military, the Air Force, did the same thing like the Army did. Whatever planes they were tired of using, they basically transferred them over to the National Guard and this plane was very tired out. This plane was used back during the Berlin airlift. The reason why they knew that it was used during the Berlin airlift, when they were cleaning the plane out and taking it apart and rebuilding it, they found two tons of coal dust in its, in its uh, inside interior. Of course, I had to throw in a little bit of Michigan weather. <laughs> you know, they, uh, in the early part, they were flying P-51s, um, that was basically the closest that they could get for jets, and then they finally got advanced to the Sabres. As I mentioned, reconnaissance. Okay, this is the last reconnaissance plane that flew out of Romulus. This is the RF-84F Thunder Flash. And you can just see right here, well, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Right here is all the cameras that was in the nose of this plane right here. And these were the, where the cameras would look through and they would just fly over. And one good example of photos is this aerial photo here. Now, how, how well does everyone know about the Cold War in Michigan? Is that, does anyone know about the missiles that were here in Michigan? All right, we had quite a few missile sites here in Michigan that was used for the, uh, during the Cold War. And Romulus, of course, was no different. Uh, on the south part, of back this up, south portion of the field, Here's the Air National Guard, but this portion here, this is part of the uh, Nike missile base. 
we had a Nike missile base here. We had two types of missiles that was here at the airport until 1971. This, full, this one here, this is the Hercules AJ, uh, Nike missile. And this missile here was nuclear uh, had a nuclear payload. Basically, it was a defensive missile. You know, and back then, not realizing how bad radio radiation was, nobody realized that, hey, if we use a nuclear missile to take out a nuclear missile, hey, that would be great. Well, not too bright back then, but that's, they were still experimenting. The other missile they had uh, was, was the uh, Ajax missile. The difference between the two missiles was the Ajax, it was just basically a defensive missile and it had a single rocket booster, whereas on the Ajax here, we had four boosters on it. That was the difference between the two missiles. All right, I'm gonna get on, I'm gonna move to the, as far as safety at the airport before I move on to the rest of the airport. The airport itself, when it came down to the civilian crash, the airport itself was responsible for taking care of any of the accidents and the Air National Guard would give them close support if, if needed or vice versa. If it was a national, Air National Guard plane that would crash, the uh, Wayne County would supply backup. There was one time from my friend that was telling me that when the Air National Guard was training, they had a burnt out hulk of a plane that they were working with. They started going through there, they went, put the fire out. Okay, let's try this again, do it again. They did it a second time, okay, they put the fire out. Not realizing that, okay, after the second time around, they should have filled up the tanks. A third time, they started the fire. They said, uh, yeah. They got a phone call from the uh, county. Are you guys okay over there? No, no, we're just practicing. They were too embarrassed to let them know that they had forgot to fill the tanks up. Of course, uh, accidents do happen. Of course, this guy was coming in from another location for the Air National Guard, and uh, they basically said he had a vision problem. <laughs> All right, this is uh, Major Montier. Uh, he's here with two, uh, two kids here that was playing in a field. He had to bail out of his airplane because of some problems, and his plane crashed in his field. Well, these two young, youngsters were playing in that field. This is, oh, I forgot his name. Oh, all right, David King and Elizabeth King. They're both son, son and daughter of the police chief of Plymouth, Michigan, and they were badly burned from the plane crash. The other kids that were there were the brothers and sisters, were not injured, but these two got hurt from the, from, from the uh, accident itself. So what they did was, when they heard that the police chief was having problems with uh, paying for the medical, uh, the Air National Guard took care of all the medical attention, invited them out for the day to show them that air, air transportation is still good. And David King expressed interest, of, according to the newspaper, of joining the Air Force. I'm still waiting to find out about that. I haven't found any information. But I, d I took this photo and I said, you know what, it's so cool about this photo is here's this kid, he's all into it. His sister's looking so bored. <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, hey, I'd rather play with a doll. Anyways, does uh, anyone remember uh, 1987? 255. That's right. Where Celine Chichen was the sole survivor of the flight. Uh, that's one worst day of the airport. I mean, they've had other accidents occur there, but that was the worst one that they ever had where there was only one survivor. Does anyone know what the cause of the flight was? That's correct, but you know why? No. All right, here's, here's the story I heard from another pilot that was working the same year that they were in for the same airlines Northwest. What happened was somebody got the bright idea, hey, if you want to save some money, when you taxi up to the uh, runway, just taxi up on one engine. Well, the FAA says, hey, that's okay with us, but they didn't bother talking to McDonnell Douglas about it. McDonnell Douglas says, you need at least that engine running at least three minutes before takeoff. So when they ta taxied up there and they gave the clearance to take off, they had, went ahead, turned on the engine, and as always, they were always running into problems with indicators going off. And they did not go through their check sheet. But while they were going through and trying to turn off all these warning lights and, si and sounds going off, they just noticed that they weren't building up enough speed to take off. So they kept throttling up more and more and more, not realizing that they did not have lift with the flaps. 
That was the whole problem. So when he took off, he hit a light pole. And after hitting the light pole, he hit the Avis building. And what they could figure out was after he hit the light pole, they figured he was trying to aim for the overpass and have the wings ripped off and go under the overpass. But it didn't quite make it out that way, and the plane flipped over and crashed. Uh, after interviews with a few people that were there, including a police officer that was there afterwards, uh, they said they could see the fear in the people's faces because they were on the ground and seen that plane going down. And it, it was like a shower of destruction all over the place. Uh, I have a photo in here that uh, one of the gentlemen that was there on, on site was uh, one of the mounted division that was over here um, out, of Rouge, or out of Hines Park. All right, so we got the police here. Wayne County was responsible for the airport since Rhombus was already having problems with uh, the county as far as paying bills for certain things. So they said, well, you know, the fight still goes on today that the airport should be paying to Rhombus some type of uh, money. But anyone recognize the gentleman in the center? Yeah. All right. Now, this is, what, this is one of the things that I remember when I was going to the airport in the 80s was these guys on the horses. This, well, I'll get back here. This gentleman here, Paul Nowak, uh, he was one of the uh, mounted horsemen that was one of the first responders. He was uh, taking his horse back, Nicholas, back to uh, uh, put him away for the night. He was done for the day, and he got the call to go back, and he was up there patrolling the tracks uh, with his horse looking for any survivors. And as he was up on the tracks, because I was trying to keep away some of the people, that, uh, some of the uh, people that was looking for souvenirs and anything they could get, um, his, notice that Nicholas kept moving his uh, hoof up and down on something. And he went down and took a look at it, and it was a uh, passenger's hand. He said it was one of the worst things he said. Uh, one of the gentlemen that I know of, well, actually, a, a um, curator for the Wayne Museum, a photographer, he was there at the time, too, and he says, one of the strangest things he thought was weird was there was a food cart in the center of it all, and it looked like it was not even touched. All right, that's our newest mode of transportation now in the airport, besides the segways. You can actually take that one square mile and fit it inside the McNamara terminal. That's how big the new terminal is, or the McNamara terminal. All right, I'm going to move on now. We're going to continue on back from the past, from the 1950s. All right, these are two people, young ladies here, that uh, found their calling at the airport. This is Rose Ruby here. Uh, she did a lot, quite a bit for the airport. She was as a mechanic at the airport, as well as a flight instructor. And this is the first uh, woman here to be a control tower operator for Detroit. Her name was Ann Muir. All right. Does anyone know the, uh, what these two buildings have in common, the Smith Terminal and the Detroit Wayne Major Terminal? Well, you know, yeah, Wayne Major Terminal being first, but do you know what they both have in common? All right, well, what's that? Tower? Uh, yes, the tower's in common. <laughs> They're the same building. All they did was, you know, they seen that the tower is in a still ideal location, so what they did was, they went and rebuilt the, air, uh, the terminal around the terminal. You can see where they had left some of the things like the elevator shaft and some of the office space there. Uh, at one point in time, before 1958, by 1956, the idea was, you know what, uh, I think we've outlived our usefulness for Wayne County Airport where it's at. There's a plan to move the airport over to the state fairgrounds. I, was really, I did not know about this until just recently when I bought a brochure off of eBay, actually a hundred copies of the brochure, <laughs> and it was basically telling, that these are the plans that we suggest that the airport should be moved to. It was also a plan to build in Windsor. That's correct. But they felt, people at the county at the time, Leroy Smith says, no, this is the best place. We got room to grow here. Leroy Smith, smart man. He was still with the county. That's right, the Smith Terminal right here. Yeah. Uh, British Airways, by 1958, was the first one to bring in the first passenger liner. 
jet passenger liner, I should say, the de Havilland Comet. There's a proclamation here from the uh, mayor of Detroit standing, okay, this is it. Well, one of the things was when I was going through this fo uh, for my photo for my book was I found this photo and it's like, I only knew this guy right here, James Davey. Well, I wanted a photo to compliment it, so I contacted uh, British uh, Airways Museum in, in, uh, uh, at London Heathrow Airport. And for my book, I got a different photo. This, this photo I came across later. That's the actual plane itself arriving for the first time. But I, I got to talk with the guy. And he says, I said, yeah, I, says, I, got the, uh, I, I like to get a copy of the Comet. I want to use it for my book. It's the first jet passenger liner to fly into Detroit Metro. Really? Okay, well, the fees are uh, $25. You're supposed to acknowledge that uh, you got uh, the photo from us. I said, okay, that sounds pretty cool. All right, well, I'll tell you what, this will complement the photo I got uh, of the, uh, with the, with the uh, pilot and uh, this other gentleman, uh, pilot and crew. Really? Uh, what photo can that be? I says, well, I got this right here. It says, I'll tell you, let's just dispense of the accounting. You send me a copy of that, and I'll send you a copy of the plane. And we'll just call it even. Just make sure you include us in your book. Not a problem. <laughs> By the name, his name was Sir James Davy. Uh, uh, British Airways was first on quite a few things. They were also the first to bring the Concorde into Detroit Metro Airport. They were contracted by Nomad, which was a, a, a club that would fly out to different destinations. They had their own personal plane, but they thought it'd be kind of neat to bring in the Concorde and fly out to England for a, on the Concorde. So they contracted out on two days to bring the Concorde in. Not one, but two for both days. And that was in this, uh, September of 1988. The airport itself, back in the 1950s and 60s, it started to grow. One of the things about this, uh, Smith Terminal, uh, 1958 was the year that they changed it from Detroit Wayne Major Airport to Detroit Metro Airport. Smith Terminal had hotel rooms right here. I did not even know that. I wasn't even aware that the Smith Terminal had a hotel on the third floor. You know, it had everything. It had a barber shop. By 1961, there was a bank, People's Bank. And you know, of course, you had a restaurant. And the food there. As back then, as well as today, it's still expensive. <laughs> but for the past few years, they were Detroit Wayne or Detroit Metro Airport has been rated number one as far as healthy food until this year when Chick Fil A comes in. Back then, life was easy. I mean, 1960s, get a tour of the airport with a tour jeep. Uh, flight attendants were known as stewardesses and. They looked great then. They had that Jackie O look. Uh, by 1968, the airport went through an expansion. Uh, they realized that, okay, we need more hotel accommodations. The Smith Terminal just can't handle it. So they built this building. They called this the Central Service Building, which was also the hotel. This was for basically for the center of the operations for the people that worked at the airport. And then the James Davy Terminal. You know, basically in honor of the uh, manager of the airport. You know, they expanded that and basically added more, more uh, concourses and basically made a big improvement of the airport. Kept getting more and more expensive to build the airport, of course. We spent well, I don't even recall what the price was then. But in 1966, they decided to name our uh, terminal here from that was built in 1958 expanded in 19 by 1966 in honor of Leroy C. Smith. He was the gentleman that was one of the architects of the airport back in 1930 when uh, when the airport opened. He also became a uh, manager for Wayne County. You know a lot of things too about the airport is there's a lot of things going on at the airport. It's not just passenger service you got UPS and you got FedEx. Unfortunately, I can speak for FedEx. I can't speak for UPS, but daily between 20 to 30,000 packages flow through Detroit Metro Airport through FedEx. This photo here was just taken a couple years ago. Uh, not last winter, but the winter before last. I got the opportunity of finding out about this. 
I have to say this, I do work for FedEx. I drive a tractor trailer. I, I found out about this, one of the managers saying, yeah, we got these bear cubs coming in from Alaska. What? Can I get, can I get photos? Well, you need a, no problem. I contacted the people in Memphis. I said, hey guys, uh, you know, I, I've got permission, you know, before for my book, How, can I get out there now? Yeah, his manager doesn't care. Yeah, go ahead. So I went ahead. I found out the grizzly cubs were coming in. You had all this news, cap, news people coming out. I was out there with my camera. I got this photo. Next thing I know, I had this guy from uh, the Detroit Free Press following me around to every place I was going at. And basically, I, I didn't mind. I had, I had to escort the guy, though. That was the problem. I was just like, oh, man, I can't shake this guy. But that's how it looked like when packages come in, all the packages there coming down. They would come down to a slide. They would put them in containers, and then they would be loaded onto planes. Right now, we fly out uh, three different, actually, Few, quite a few different aircraft out. We fly MD-11s, DC-10s, uh, a couple of Airbuses, and some 757s. A few years ago, uh, well, actually, when I wrote this book, it was just two years ago, I should say, when my daughter had an accident, I had to take her to court. I was talking with one of the security guards there and talking about my book, and he says, yeah, yeah, I, says, I got your book. I really like it. I says, you got a picture of me in there, really? Yeah, yeah. I says, what photo was that? Well, you know that Northwest? I said, were you a pilot? No, I was that undercover cop that was walking past. <laughs> I, I just know him as, know him as Paul. And if I had known that he was an undercover cop, I would have put him in the book, in his name in the book. But that is Northwest on strike. We'll come to our last photo for the day. <laughs> I don't know how long this actually took, but this is our airport today. Uh, these, hey, this hangar here, Came in the early, or actually late 1990s, early, early 2000s. This building here is now replaces the Davy Terminal, and the uh, old Central Service with the hotel. We still have our Smith Terminal. Back off over this way, which you can't see, which no longer exists, was the uh, building 278, the uh, old hangar, and we still have our Executive Terminal. But here's the McNamara Terminal. As I said, you could actually take that whole square mile and fit it inside this complex here. Federal Express is over here located here. You got UPS at the opposite end. And we, right here, this used to be the old American Airlines cargo facility, now no longer in use from them. We've uh, done some upgrading at the airports. We have a new uh, police uh, facility as well as a security facility. We had a hangar over here, or actually it wasn't a hangar, it was more of a cargo facility for American Airlines. They took the building down to the bones, just the framework, and rebuilt it, and it's now our police station, our emergency department, any, basically a center for emergency. Inside that building itself, and I can't show you photos of that, I did take some photos, I was out giving a tour of that. It has a, uh, how would you say, a main room in there that controls everything. It's basically a control room so they can watch on monitors every part of the airport of what's going on. And that's it. Thank you for coming. I don't know how long this lasted, but thank you.